Gracious Heavenly Father, as we turn now to your word, fill us again with the wonder of your grace and mercy. Help me to preach your word faithfully and clearly, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. And by your same Spirit, melt our hearts with the gospel of grace, that we may love others like you do, and share your concern for the lost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it nothing to you, you that pass by? Is it nothing to you that millions sit in darkness and the shadow of death while the day has dawned for you? So wrote Alan Cole, one of OMF's greatest missionaries who, who worked in the new villages here in Malaysia in the 1950s. Now, when the doors closed for the missionaries in China during that time, during the Cultural Revolution, many of them relocated here to Malaysia. Uh, they brought with them a burning desire to bring the gospel to those who had never heard it, particularly in the new villages. Now, this meant considerable suffering for the missionaries uh, in an age where houses had no air conditioning and snakes would regularly squirm into their house. Uh, and yet the missionaries came. Uh, many of them learning dialects like Hokkien and Hakka in order to bring the gospel to the lost. As we finish the book of Jonah, our focus turns to our heart. Do we share God's heart for the lost? Do we look out on the world with a burning compassion that drives us to share the gospel? Or are we content to keep the riches of Christ? all to ourselves. Well, let us remember where we're up to in the book. In Jonah chapter 1, we saw how instead of obeying God's command to preach to the Ninevites, he fled in the opposite direction. Uh, but soon he found himself under the judgment of God. We saw that God was merciful. Uh, not only did he save uh, the sailors from the great storm, but he also saved Jonah himself. Uh, in Jonah chapter 2, we saw how God answered Jonah's prayer, saving him from certain death uh, as he was swallowed up from, by a fish and then spat out on the dry land. And in Jonah chapter 3, we saw how God sent Jonah to Nineveh a second time. And as he preached of the coming judgment on Nineveh, something remarkable happened. The people responded radically in repentance and faith, calling out to God in prayer. And just like the sailors and just like Jonah, God heard their prayers for mercy and he relented of their destruction. We might think we have actually already reached the end of the book, but here we have one last episode and a surprising twist. Chapter 4 begins with the angry prophet. The angry prophet, we're at point one. As Jonah sees Nineveh graciously spared from God's judgment, he is enraged. Look at verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, I wonder if uh, your preaching had been so successful, you might have imagined the response would be rather different. I mean, just imagine that you went spent one whole day preaching in Penang, and within a few days, the entire city was converted to Christ, I think you'd be pretty happy, pretty amazed at God's powerful work. But not Jonah. It is exceedingly evil to Jonah. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but in almost every chapter, we've met this word, exceedingly. Chapter 1, verse 10, the sailors were exceedingly afraid of the storm. Uh, but after God calmed the storm, chapter 1, verse 16, the sailors feared the Lord exceedingly. At chapter 3, verse 3, we were told Nineveh was a, an exceedingly great city to God. And now we're told Jonah is exceedingly upset because of the injustice and the evil he perceives in the mercy of God. Jonah thinks that God is wrong to forgive the Ninevites. He wants justice, not mercy. And so he is angry. Uh, in verse 2, he re reveals to us why he ran in the first place. Look at verse 2. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? 
That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah tells us he ran because he knew what the outcome of his preaching would be. He, he knew from the law that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You can read in Exodus 34. He, he knows that God would rather see a sinner repent than die. God longs for mercy over judgment. But Jonah wants the opposite. Jonah wanted them to be destroyed. And so he thought that it, he could guarantee it if he just ran away, if he didn't preach to them, if he withhold, held God's word from the Ninevites, then they, he would be able to guarantee their judgment, even if he had to sacrifice his own life. It's, it's a reverse of the gospel. Jesus willingly sacrifices his life that we might be saved. Well, Jonah willingly faces the judgment of God in the hope that others will be judged. And that explains why Jonah preached as he did back in chapter 3, verse 4. He preached and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He, he came with a message only of judgment, no hint of hope or mercy. Because Jonah hoped with that kind of negative message, he would guarantee they would perish. And that's why Jonah is so angry in chapter 4, because despite all that he's done to, to try and guarantee their destruction, God has still saved them. He declares, therefore, in verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. He says to God, look, I'd rather that you kill me than let the Ninevites go free. He sounds to me like a two-year-old child who doesn't get their way. Except Jonah's no child. He's meant to be a prophet of God. And so God challenges him in verse 4. The Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Now, of course, at one level, we can put ourselves in Jonah's shoes. The, the Ninevites were a ruthless and, and, and brutal people who did unspeakable things. They certainly deserved God's judgment. God himself said that in chapter 1. But it is very risky ground, isn't it, to presume to stand in judgment upon God, to assert that God is evil because he chooses to forgive. After all, God is all-knowing. God is eternal. God is perfectly good. And Jonah himself asserts that in chapter 4. But we are weak. We are finite. We are sinful. Will we ever be in a position to question the justice of God? course not. Jonah is a hypocrite. He prays God for the salvation he received in chapter 2 and then he presumed to judge God for treating the Ninevites in exactly the same way. Now we might wonder how can God be both perfectly merciful and perfectly just? How can God forgive sinners and yet not let the guilty go unpunished? Because the Bible, after all, does assert that God is both merciful and just. Well, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the solution is foreshadowed in the sacrificial system, where a bull would be sacrificed as a substitute, taking the punishment that was deserved so that the guilty may go free. And that would be fulfilled in the New Testament. As Jesus died on the cross as our substitute, as he took on himself our sins and the, the punishment that we deserve. Jesus died so that God can graciously forgive people like the Ninevites and people like us without ever compromising his perfect justice. God was not wrong to forgive the Ninevites. God was not being unjust. Jonah was wrong for failing to trust God for things he did not understand or like. Well, I wonder if any of us this morning have questions or doubts like Jonah does. I mean, how, how can he choose to save some but not others? How can he choose to save someone like that? Why does he allow 
particular challenges to come in my life? Why doesn't God save more people than he does or less? They're all good questions. And we can ask any question of God. But we learn from Jonah here, we must ask them in humility and faith, trusting that God is wise and good, never in anger and unbelief. Well, Jonah gives no reply to God's question, is do you do well to be angry? But God intends to teach him a lesson. And we're now at point two, the gracious Lord. Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. So Jonah sits and waits, still hoping that the city may yet be destroyed, that, that somehow with his anger that he's been able to change God's mind so that he won't actually save it. It's a rather wicked thing to do really, isn't it? But God responds with mercy to Jonah. Verse 6, now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. Now, again, the word appointed here should be rather familiar to us. It's not the first time we've read it in Jonah. In chapter 1, verse 17, when Jonah was thrown overboard, God graciously appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and save him from death. And once again, God is gracious to Jonah, even as Jonah rages against him, this time not saving him from death at the bottom of the ocean, but from, well, from sunburn. Verse 6 reads, uh, not uh, literally, not uh, saved him from discomfort. Literally, verse 6 says, God saved him from his evil. And we see Jonah's response in verse 6. Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Jonah's hypocrisy is exposed. Jonah is exceedingly glad when God saves him from his evil. But he's exceedingly angry when God saves the Ninevites from their evil. Except Jonah's evil is just a little sunburn. Whereas the Ninevites is saved from certain destruction. Jonah is exceedingly glad about his salvation from the hot sun but he's exceedingly angry at the salvation of the Ninevites from death. He's a hypocrite. But God is not finished in exposing Jonah. Verse 7 and 8, when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. Once again, God in his sovereignty decides to intervene into Jonah's situation, but this time not in grace, but in judgment. He appoints a worm to kill the plant and then a scorching wind so that Jonah is now hot, sweaty and uncomfortable. How does Jonah respond? Verse 8, he asked that he might die and said, it's better for me to die than to live. It's a rather extreme response, isn't it? Jonah is angry, very angry. There he is, hoping that God's judgment is going to fall upon the, the evil Ninevites. And now God's judgment falls on him instead. Jonah is angry with God. Angry when God withholds his compassion and judgment and judges him. And yet he wants the very same thing to happen to the Ninevites. So who is right here? Which is right, anger or compassion? Verse 9, God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry, even to die, angry enough to die. Now Jonah is childish and pathetic, isn't he? He's angry enough to die because of a plant whose shade he enjoyed for just one day. I mean, is a plant really that precious? God uses Jonah's reaction to turn the tables. Verse 10. The Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labour, 
nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? If Jonah can get so worked up over a little plant that's here today and then gone tomorrow, how much more should God feel that way about the city of Nineveh? The people cannot tell their right hand from their left, powerless, ignorant, unable to save themselves. It's a wonderful picture of God, isn't it? Despite all their wickedness, God loves the Ninevites. And what a contrast between Jonah's heart and God's heart. I hope you will never accept a statement that the Old Testament God is only angry and vengeful, but the God of the New Testament is loving. No, God is the same God. Yesterday, today and forever. The God who never changes. The God of love and mercy who doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the New is the same. And here is the real challenge of the book of Jonah. Do we share God's heart? Do we have compassion and love like God does? Well, once again, before we apply this passage to ourselves, let's consider how it is fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. For the God who, who so loved and saved the Ninevites was the same God who sent his son Jesus Christ to save a sinful world. I wonder if you remember Luke chapter 15. Uh, where Jesus is being criticised the, by the religious leaders for accepting sinners. And he tells them the parable of the prodigal son. Remember the parable that the, the youngest son rejects his father. He takes his inheritance and squanders it in wild living with prostitutes. But when he returns sometime later to his father, when he comes before him in repentance... The father's response is, is totally unexpected. Not anger, not rejection, but in compassion and mercy, he joyfully welcomes his son home. And so in, in, in the father of the parable of the prodigal son, we see the heart of our heavenly father who, who, who loves lost people who forgives those who repent, who celebrates when sinners come home, who is full of mercy and compassion and steadfast love. And that's, of course, why Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners in the gospel. And that is why Jesus goes on a journey to Jerusalem. That is why Jesus dies on a cross for sinful people like us. Because Jesus shares his Father's heart he longs for sinners to be saved. But of course, you might remember in the parable, there's also a second son who doesn't share his father's heart. Remember the older son? When he hears that his younger brother has returned and his father has forgiven him, well, he responds in anger, just like Jonah. And just as, as God entreats Jonah, so the father goes out to entreat his older son, sharing with him his heart. In the Luke 15, 32, the father says, It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Jonah is just like the older son. In Luke 15. He's just like the, the Pharisees of Jesus' day. He ought to be rejoicing in God's grace and mercy, but instead he is angry. It's clear he doesn't share the Father's heart at all. God's heart is for the lost, and where Jonah lacks the Father's heart, 
Jesus exemplifies it perfectly. That's why he goes to the cross for people like us. So what about us? The question for us this morning is, do we share God's heart for the lost? Are we like Jonah or are we like Jesus? Now, sometimes, sadly, I observe that church-going Christians rather lack the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes they're much more like the Pharisees, hard towards each other, desiring justice over relationship, full of anger and lacking mercy and grace, feared by people but not embraced by people, more like Jonah, less like Jesus. Of course, don't hear me wrong, justice is important. God is the righteous judge who will bring about perfect justice in the end. God threatened punishment on the Ninevites for their sin. But without ever compromising his justice, God still longs to show mercy. God longs to forgive. And, and so if we are his people, who have received that grace and salvation ourselves, which we don't deserve, we too ought to reflect that same attitude of grace and mercy towards others, especially to the people of God. And so if, as we reflect, we recognise actually we are full of anger, full of hardness of heart, we do have a, a, a critical spirit towards other people, then perhaps God wants us to reflect this morning and remember his heart. Perhaps he wants you to repent and pray that he would make you more like him. But we're not just to have this heart towards other Christians. We are especially to pray that we may share God's heart for the lost. Let me ask you, what do you, what do you see as you look around uh, at the people about you in everyday life, as you go to work, as you drive your car, as you go to the supermarket, as you buy your lunch, what do you see? Do you see Indians and Chinese, rich and poor, men and women, young and old? Or do you see lost people who desperately need salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, as you consider your family, your friends, your colleagues, your country, your world, do you feel compassion for the millions of people who are headed to eternal judgment apart from Christ? Are you filled with a longing that they would be saved? Or are you indifferent, more concerned about your own life than the salvation of others? just like Jonah and his plant. See, if we know the God of compassion and mercy who, who gave his only son for guilty sinners, how much more should we share his heart for the lost? Uh, that was the heart of Alan Cole and the other missionaries when they came to Malaysia those years ago. And that is why they were willing to make tremendous sacrifices to preach the gospel in the new villages. It was because they recognised that if people like them did not go, many more would perish without Christ and without hope. It was those same OMF missionaries that wrote the famous hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished. It expresses it so well. Look at verse 2 of that song. Where other lords beside you hold their unhindered sway, where forces that defied you defy you still today, with none to heed their crying for life and love and light, unnumbered souls are dying and pass into the night. The hymn ends in the fourth verse with a rousing plea to action. O Father who sustained them, O Spirit who inspired, Saviour whose love constrained them to toil with zeal untired, from cowardice defend us, from lethargy awake, forth on your errand send us to labour for your sake. 
friends one third of the world's population live in people groups that are untouched by the gospel of Christ. 86% of the world's Muslims, Hindus and Buddhists do not know a, a single Christian personally. And many of those people live right here in Malaysia. Do we have pity on the billions of people who have never heard of the cross or known of God's love? Do we care like God does? Or are they a threat, an inconvenience, or just an irrelevance? Are we more concerned about our pathetic little plants that make our own lives more comfortable than the eternal destiny of the lost? If you this morning know the God who showed steadfast love to you, if you know the God who gave his son to save you,